Welcome to Roberts and Jenna's Live. It's time for, oh, we're all the way down there, March the 20th, Wednesday. So glad you could be here today. As you can tell, I'm a little under the weather. My voice is a little scratchy and just keep having to fight these little bugs that come and bother me. So here I am, and uh, fortunately... I can speak a little, so I'll go as far as I can today. And just to remind you, as you know, this program is set aside for you to ask your questions, give your comments on any topic whatsoever. And I, as my role as host of this program, will endeavor to answer your questions to the best of my ability using our Catholic faith, scripture, tradition, the fathers, the medievals, the theologians, the saints, the doctors, the catechisms, the encyclopedias, and just about anything I can find to help you walk away satisfied that your question has indeed been answered. We come to you every Wednesday afternoon between 3 and 5 Eastern Standard Time. As you can tell by the sun hitting my books back there, uh, it is 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> And fortunately, we have about, what, four or four and a half more hours of light. Thanks to daylight savings time. Anyway, um, so we got a lot of um, email questions today that I'm going to have to cover. And I got some news items. That's, uh, you know, whatever strikes me out there that's like really odd and, um, you know, things that we really should keep up with. Um, I will mention them from time to time. And um, so I want to get to some of those. And uh, and I'll also get to the email questions. Um, Pope Francis, uh, <laughs> gosh, this guy is just a little too much. Um, I hate to call him this guy. You know, he is the Pope, but um, sometimes you just, you got to call a spade a spade. You know what I'm saying? That's what we say back in Italy. Hey, Goomba. <laughs> All right. So um, the Pope, um, yesterday it was, denounced uh, anti-vaxxers. <laughs> those who believe that uh, they should never take the COVID jab. And he says, it's an almost suicidal act of denial. <laughs> you wonder if, if, if he is um, uh, <laughs> actually, you know what? I don't even want to go there. I'm just going to tell you what the Pope said. Okay, so you take it or leave it, whatever you like. Um, then we have in another news item, President Biden hosts Papal Nuncio Christophe Pierre, Father James Martin, and Father James Martin at the White House at St. Patrick's Day brunch. <laughs> Isn't that nice? So I don't know much about Christophe Pierre. The nuncio, um, but we do know a lot about Father James Martin, and this just fits in with the whole liberal mentality, doesn't it? Sometimes it doesn't even make a difference whether you're Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. The real where the rubber meets the road is whether you're liberal or conservative, because liberal uh, mentality. They all like to get together. They don't care what denomination or church or culture or whatever, wherever you come from. As long as you believe in liberal ideas, you're one of the pack. And uh, that sure seems what it, it is the case today. Um, and I have found another article um, where sex abuse by Catholic nuns often overlooked. So survivors band together to raise awareness. <laughs> I hate to laugh at this stuff, but it's like, what the heck is going on? Um, I mean, nuns? 
Oh my God. What do they have? Uh, you know, well, no, I don't want to get, get into that, but, um, apparently it's been going on and everybody's sort of been worried about the priests and now we have the nuns. I'm sure this is nothing new, but it's just so prevalent. That's the problem, you know? Um, all right. So here's another news item. Again, I'm not going to get into these too deep. I just want to share them with you because they crossed my desk and I just was like, oh, my gosh. You know, you just keep living uh, and you think that this is just all a nightmare. Somehow it's going to go away, but it just keeps coming and it keeps getting worse. And that's what we're seeing today. So here's another one it says now Francis voices approval of legal recognition of same-sex unions. So I didn't get too far into this. Uh, well, this is March 15th, last uh, Friday. And it says, and yet another set of declarations included in his autobiography to be published in a few days by Harper Collins. From the excerpt made available by Italian daily Cor Corrieri uh, della Sera, quote, it is right that these people, this is the Pope speaking, okay, in his bi autobiography, okay, that means he's writing it himself. Um, it is right that these people who are living the gift of love, living, and, and in the background it has the Pope going like this, and the two gay guys kissing each other. That, and they're holding up a little heart that says, love is supreme. And an American flag and a gay flag. My goodness gracious. All right, anyway, let me start again. So Francis is apparently writing, and this is an excerpt from his autobiography. It is right that these people who are living the gift of love can have legal coverage like everyone else. Jesus often went out to meet people who lived in the margins. And that's what the church should be doing today with people from the LGBTQ plus community who within the church are often marginalized. Make them feel at home, especially those who have received. And I don't have the rest of it. Anyway, you see how they use the gospel, what Jesus did with, you know, the harlots or the tax collectors or whatever, and make that into the norm, you know, like Jesus would normally accept these people, you know, without repentance. The whole reason Jesus, you know, lent his hand to them was to bring them to repentance. Uh, otherwise, they'd be just as like everybody else, uh, and even worse, because they're going to pay for those sins they did if they don't repent. Um, Catholic faith is very strict on that. Even if you do repent, you, there's going to be a payment for what you did that was evil. But the Pope's just, you know, using that gospel um, directive as like, with no repentance whatsoever, asked for. Like, it's totally normal for these people to do this, and we have to accept it. So, um Okay, here's another article from um, um, this. This was a flashback, I, I guess, from when the Pope met Joe Biden. Um, Pope, the Pope called Biden, quote, a good Catholic, unquote, and said to, quote, keep receiving communion, unquote. This was from October 29th, 2021, but I thought it was well worth repeating here. President Joe Biden told reporters on Friday, October 29th, 2021, that when he met with the Pope, Francis, earlier in the day, the pontiff told the president he was a good Catholic and should continue taking communion. Now, I, now I, around this time, if I remember correctly, 
a priest friend of mine from South Carolina. Um, this was back in 2019, maybe? Yeah, right before the election, 2020. And I've known this priest for probably 20, 20 years, at least 20 years. Good friend of mine. Father Maury is his name. And I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning that. Um, I don't think he will. Um, he refused communion to Joe Biden when Joe Biden was doing a campaign tour in South Carolina back in, I think, 2019, or could have been 2020, I don't know. Um, one of the only priests I know, I think there was one other priest, or maybe it was a bishop, who refused communion to Joe Biden. And um, and he, it was made the news, of course. Um, and Joe Biden, when he was up there at the altar, well, near, near the altar, of course, uh, protested, you know, why are you doing this to me? And the priest just said, because of your stance on abortion. <laughs> so it took a lot of courage for him to do that, but he did it. And he used to be congratulated. He's now in his 70s, retired. I just talked to him last week. He's doing well, but he, he was the only one, you know. So um, every, even the Pope's telling Joe, go ahead, go receive communion, Joe. No big deal. You know, and all that uh, warning that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians 11 about he who eats and drinks unworthily, that is, you have mortal sin on your soul, and you go receive communion. He says he drinks damnation to himself, Paul says. Drinks damnation to himself. So these are both clueless people leading the world, which speaks for itself, of course. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Let me see. Is there an another news item here? Um. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, before we leave this one, let me just say, you know what? As far as abortion is concerned, the U.S. bishops still, still have enough power and influence that if they banded together today and every single one of them, 200 and what, 40 some bishops just in the United States, if they banded together under Christoph Pierre, the nuncio, and, and condemned abortion and, and said that anybody who practices abortion, politician or layperson, whoever, cleric, you're excommunicated. And we're going to write your name down on a list of people that are officially excommunicated from the Catholic Church. You me, they, would stop abortion tomorrow. That is a fact. That's all they would have to do. You know, and that includes Nancy Pelosi and all these other Catholics in the Senate and in the House uh, or the White House who pretend to be Catholic. Um, if the popes would have enough courage, and they don't, of course, because they're with them. They're siding with these liberals because all liberals think alike. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a politician, a cleric in the Catholic Church, or a Protestant or a Jew. They're all going to think alike. That's the most amazing thing. All the divisions of religion, money, uh, cultural um, influence, upbringing, all that is just swept aside when you're a liberal. Everybody, you know, gay, straight, it doesn't matter. They're all one unit. It's amazing to watch. Uh, so, um, but that's the truth. They could stop it tomorrow. You know, here we were looking at the, at the Supreme Court, and basically all they did was pass the buck. You know, they didn't say, well, abortion is wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. You're killing another human being who has constitutional rights. Just because he's small doesn't mean he's not a human. Um, you know, so they just pass the buck to the states. 
And now we have more confusion than we did before. Okay. And if you want to go get an abortion, well, you go to a state that allows it. And on the on the uh, east coast and the left coast, you have all kinds of states give give you an abortion. They'll they'll give it to you for free <laughs> if you want it bad enough. Um, but we have the bishops have the power to stop that if they would excommunicate every single politician that was involved in this. You could do it tomorrow. Okay. And man, you know what? I would not want to be a bishop today who will stand before God's judgment seat. And God's going to say, you know what? You had the power to stop the killing of these innocent babies. And you would rather live in luxury and have three meals a day, get real fat and laugh at everyone's jokes, you know, and, and, you know, pat everybody on the back as a politician and speak kindly to the president and the Pope and everybody. And you just wanted to be one of the boys, you know, and just never had the courage to do what I told you to do. Depart from me. I never knew you. Can you imagine hearing those words from Jesus Christ? After you've lived your whole life, depart from me. I never knew you. Well, that's what many or most or all of these bishops are going to face for not standing up for the innocent and treating it like just another political issue that they can toss around like a football. Sad. And then I learned also that the... Um, well, I've known this for a while, and I was amazed at it. The Catholic Relief Services. What a, what a um, sham that is. Catholic Relief Services. These are all like under the NGO, the, the clause of government establishments, and um, they're killing babies left and right, and they are promoting contraception, everything against church law, you can imagine, in, in the name of Jesus and in the name of human humanity, you know, uh, and pretending that they're helping people. And they get a hundred, what is it? No, one billion dollars per year from the U.S. government, Catholic Relief Services. So there is a marriage made in hell right there from the U.S. government, okay, to fund abortions, contraception, anything that would bring a new happy baby into the world. See, why, why are they allowing so many, um, <laughs> you know, people from other countries to cross the border? Because you know why? Because we need, any country is going to need about 2.6 children per family in order to have the population remain steady and not go down. 2.6, okay? And you know where we are? 1.9. 1.9 per family. Why? Because they're all killing their babies. Okay, so that means our population is decreasing of the citizens of the United States. And the only way it's being propped up is by allowing all these illegal aliens into the states. And, of course, all these liberals, high-flying liberals who need their, um, you know, their crops um, picked and dusted and whatever, they want this cheap labor, baby, especially California. It's the, the fertile crescent of the United States produces one eighth the GNP of the United States. Yeah, baby, we need some cheap labor to pick all these crops and sell it to the rest of the world. So, yeah, that's why we want them to come up. You know, I mean, nobody tells you this stuff, of course, but that's what's happening. Okay. So, 
Uh, all right, let me get to the other uh, questions here. We had some email questions come in. Um, oh, yeah, that's for me. Uh, somebody sent me some stuff in about Jimmy Aiken. And um, I don't know, Jimmy, he's an anomaly to me. Uh, I wish him the best. I, You know, he's a very lovable guy. Uh, I don't think he would hurt a fly. But um, he apparently believes in Bigfoot. Um, I know I had some more information on that. Bigfoot, the Big Bang, evolution. Um, well, you know, I, I, a lot of that is because of his hanging around with Carl Keating for many years. Let me tell you something about that. You know, Carl Keating's first book was published, what, 1981, was it? It's called Catholicism and Fundamentalism. Okay. Now, that's a curious title, and I always wondered about that. Um, the reason he does that, he, he put that as the title, instead of Catholicism and Protestantism, okay? He didn't want that title. It's Catholicism and Fundamentalism. Why? Well, because he's just as against Catholic people who take the Bible at face value, as he is Protestants who take the Bible at face value. And the derogatory term that was developed by the Catholic liberals, you know, like Father Raymond Brown and all his entourage, he wrote the Jerome Biblical Commentary and then revised it in, in the early 90s. But um, they, they would call Catholic conservatives, and I'm including a, a lot of bishops who were back in the 50s um, conservative, you know, wanted to do what the church had always taught. And Father Brown and his liberals who wanted to change every doctrine they saw, and you can read all about it in his books, and the only way he got away with that was by putting a question mark after his challenge. Do we need to keep believing in papal infallibility? Question mark. Do we need to believe in the Immaculate Conception of Mary? Question mark. Do we need to believe that women can't be priests? Question mark. You see. And so he would skate right through. Because nobody could say, well, he's not saying that women can be priests. He's just putting a question mark. We need to study this again. But basically what he's saying is, no, I don't believe that women shouldn't be priests. I want them to be priests. Okay. I don't believe that Mary was immaculately conceived. You know. I don't believe in the virgin birth, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you go down the list. So these were uh, theologians, and he's just one of hundreds of them that were going through Catholic seminaries in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s also. Uh, and they were just waiting for the dam to break where they could finally take over, and they did. They're in the, they're in, 95% of the Catholic universities and seminaries we have today, okay? Uh, Monsignor George Kelly was one of those conservatives who was fighting against people like Father Raymond Brown. I met him in New York, um, gosh, probably 20 or so years ago. I had gone up there to do a debate against James White, and um, somebody said, you got to meet Father or Monsignor George Kelly, and he wrote a book against people like Father Brown, who would, he said are destroying the Catholic Church. And now they're all getting into the seminaries and the universities, and by the time they're done, we're going to have nothing left. And he's right. And he sat me down. He says, Robert, you're young. you got a long way to go, and let me tell you what's going on in the church. Okay? And I heard it right from the horse's mouth because he was one of the top guys who was trying to maintain the traditional Catholic faith. And uh, he was being shot down left and right. Okay, so um, now I lost my train of thought. Where, where, oh, 
Carl Keating in his book. Um, so it's Catholicism. In other words, it's liberal Catholicism. Okay. Uh, and especially in the areas of Genesis, you know, do we read Genesis literally or not? Um, in the area of uh, evolution, um, things of, of that nature. That's That was Carl's baby. You know, he believed like it was God himself telling him to believe in evolution and the Big Bang Theory and all that stuff, which is what James uh, Jimmy Aiken believes in, okay? And, you know, throw Bigfoot in there. A and these guys, look, they won't even talk to you about whether they could possibly be wrong about this stuff, you know, evolution and Big Bangism and all that stuff. They won't even talk to you, okay? And and so that's where all this is coming from. It's not coming necessarily against Protestants. Catholic Answers is coming against anyone who takes Scripture at face value that they don't agree with, of course. Now, there's not saying that everything Catholic Answers reads in the Bible they don't take it face value. I mean, you have to take the Eucharist at face value, don't you? You know, Jesus says, um, take and eat. This is my body. Well, they better take that at face value or else they won't be Catholic. Okay. So there are exceptions to the rule. But anything other than, you know, the the integral doctrines of, the, of Catholicism, <laughs> no. It is, the Bible is not to be interpreted literally like that. Okay, we don't do that anymore. And if you do that, you're a fundamentalist. Okay? You're a fundamental. They have a perfect name for you. You believe in the fundamentals. Well, we used to believe those, you know, for close to 2,000 years. But we just don't believe those anymore. Because science is now the truth holder. Whatever mainstream popular science says is the truth that you have to maintain, not the Bible, not traditional Catholic teaching, okay? So, and, and Jimmy Aiken will come along and say, you know, don't listen to those scientists from the Creation Research Institute, or uh, there's a, like half a dozen of these Protestant, yeah, um, who are pushing creationism, and rightly so. He says, don't listen to any of them. Only listen to the mainstream scientists who believe in evolution, you see. So, and most of those guys are atheists. At least the Protestants believe in Jesus. Okay? Not the, not the atheists who believe in evolution. They're, 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 they're as godless as godless can be. And yet Jimmy Aiken is telling us to go listen to them. They have the truth. Okay? So Jimmy believes that we came from monkeys. And... <laughs> You know, so uh, other than that, you know, I like the guy. He's a good guy. You know, like I said, he wouldn't harm a fly. But um, when it comes to these kinds of things, you got to be careful. So that's as much as I'm going to say on this question. Um, um all right, so another somebody else wrote in and wanted to know, wanted me to do a do-over on the question of how we got so many races in the world and um, why um, there's animals like kangaroos in Australia and blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to just go through that for five minutes here. Um, so here's what happened. Um, you have the flood occur, okay? Before fl the flood, we believe that there was one solid landmass called Pangaea, okay? And that's, well, there's a lot to it, but one of the ways you can see this is by looking at South America like it fits right into Africa, like it was hand and glove many years ago. Okay, and then you could squeeze the other continents in, and you can you can make a puzzle of one landmass. Okay, and then the rest of the Earth was water. 
Um, and then at the flood, it says that the um, in Genesis 7, it says that the land broke up. So there would be fissures in, uh, or cracks, let's say, in the Pangaea landmass. And the water from the ground, and there's a lot of it down there, believe me, three times as much as is in the oceans, believe it or not, um, would come up through those cracks and go up into the atmosphere and keep doing that for 40 days or so. And that's why it could rain for 40 days. It's not that the clouds had enough water to rain for 40 days. Most of the water was coming from underneath the surface of the earth and shooting up into the atmosphere. Okay. And um, so right then you see that the content, content has started to form. All right. And then after a year of this flood, then uh, the animals are let out of the ark. And what's the condition of Pangaea? Well, it, start, it started to crack. And the momentum of these consonants is going to continue to spread them from one another. Okay. But in the beginning, they were cracked, but they weren't spread very far because there wasn't enough time. When you have momentum of a big continental landmass, like that's going to move, but it's going to move slowly. Okay. So when the animals came out, uh, you still basically had Pangaea, but you had a lot of cracks in it and they were getting bigger and bigger all the time, but you still had land bridges where they, you know, you could go anywhere. And uh, so the kangaroos went south and uh, the bears went north and the lions went in, you know, into the uh, state around the equator. Okay. And, uh, and then as the land masses continued with the momentum, they began to separate all the more until thousands of years later, they are where they are now. Okay. And so the kangaroos got taken to Australia and the, the lions stayed around the, the equator and the bears went north and that's where we find them all today. Okay. So, in other words, I think what you were thinking was that as Pangaea broke up, it was like, you know, this massive shift of consonants happened all of a sudden. Okay? No. Okay, so we had enough where they broke apart and made cracks and the water went through. And that's why the water could go up so high into the atmosphere. Because the smaller the hole that they have to go through, the more pressure there's going to be to get the water, uh, uh, more pressure there's going to be on the water and the higher it's going to go. So it's going to go right into the atmosphere. Okay. And um, so the cracks are there, but they're, but the continental masses have not really split a whole lot. Okay. That only starts to happen once the momentum happens. You see, momentum is a very important physical law. Okay, and we've all know what momentum is. Like you're driving in a car 60 miles an hour and you crash into another car. What causes that big catastrophe of metal all over the place? Because it's the momentum of the two cars meeting each other. Okay. It's, um, you know, let us think of a better example. Um, um, you throw a ball a couple yards and it ends up, you know, 15 yards, you know, away from you. Why is that? Well, because the momentum takes over after it leaves your hand, it's got momentum and it's going to keep going. And that momentum is M times V velocity times mass. And so you get a lot of mass in a continental mass. So, and you got V, let's say V is, I don't know, a few feet per second. Um, you multiply those two together, you got a lot of momentum. And so those continents are going to keep on going until they, the momentum slows down. That may not be till thousands of years later. Okay. By that time, all the animals basically have decided where they want to go. Okay. 
And um, that's why you're going to find kangaroos in Australia. Okay. Um, now, as far as the, the um, races are concerned, well, see, this God has built us in such a way where our physical um, constitution is adaptable to different climates. Okay. We didn't need that before, but it's there built into us. Okay. So basically um, those, and they happen very fast within a generation or two, those adaptations will start taking place. And after the flood, you had a lot of temperature change. The, the average temperature probably dropped about 10, 15 degrees. Okay. Because the world was not the same as it was before. And the pressure probably changed as well. Um, not drastically because you're going to need a sufficient amount of pressure, but um, this is what they're finding now. The less pressure you have, the less healthy you're going to be. Now, it can't be too much pressure, of course, because it will, that could kill you. But um, if the temperature and pressure changes, it's going to do not so good things to your body, and your body has to adapt if it's going to survive. And God's built that into us, into our DNA. Okay? And um, if you live around the equator, you know, where the temperature is the greatest, well, your skin is going to need to be protected, okay? And that's why you have dark people around the equator and every place near that. Whereas in the north, you find what? Swedish people or blonde hair, blue eye. Um, <laughs> and that's because they don't need that protection. It's not as hot. The sun does is not as frequent, you know? So their bodies did not change like... The, the people that live near the equator, okay? And that just makes common sense. But the fact is, this is the way God built us, all right, to adapt to whatever environment we have to go to. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive, okay? So that's why you have different races. And as you know, the races are based on skin color, okay? Um, and uh, that's the most salient feature of what makes a certain race then you have other things too like you know hair eyes and but they're not as prominent but they they you know but they do play a part so you know that's why you have those different races and you've had thousands of years after the flood to do that all right so let's you know say the flood occurred around 2500 bc um the 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 world is not very populated we find Abraham coming from Ur, the Chaldees. This is where civilization began, basically, after the flood. Um, that's the Chaldean, the Mesopotamian area. Um, and he's in 2000 BC. Okay. So uh, that's at least 500 years after the flood. Um, and then you had nations building and all, and that's another 500 years. By the time Israel is in Egypt and blah, blah. So you got a lot of time there for a lot of variation. And we know the variation began to lessen the lifespan of man because whereas Shem died at 600 years old and he was the son of Noah, um, the couple of generations after him, they died at 400. And a couple of generations after them, they died at 200. And then by the time you get to Abraham, it's down to 175. By the time you get to Joseph, who was the son of Jacob, he died at 110. Okay, so look at that drastic swing from 2500 BC down to about um, in Joseph's time, that would be like 1400 BC. Okay, so that's 1100 years. And look at the drastic change in the age because the climate changed, okay? 
It was not this pristine environment anymore. That's part of the punishment that we have. And so if that's happening, the body has to adapt or else it won't even survive, much less, you know, live to 175 like Abraham did. And so things have to happen in the body and they have to adjust to what the climate is. And over 1,100 years, there's a lot that can be done. Okay. So I think that should answer that question. Um, all right. So here's a question. What's your advice on raising girls? I currently have two toddlers and I want to see them grow up without being indifferent to their faith or without losing faith. I try to pray every night with them and read from the picture Bible I got them. What about college? How do I convince my wife not to send them to college? Well, yeah, so we got some big questions to deal with, don't we, in our generation. I mean, just a generation ago, uh, my mom, mom and dad did not have to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, you know, they came from a strict Italian family. And you did what you were told or else you were going to get the strap. And that said a lot. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to convince me. Um, and even then, I still gave them a lot of trouble. You know, so. <laughs> um, I, you know, Wes, I, I wish I had the, the secret formula for you. Okay. I don't. Um, there's kids in my family have 11. Some of the kids that I thought will turn out to be demonic, <laughs> if I could use that term lightly, turned out to be the best Catholics in the family who know and love the Lord and want to follow his ways. There's others that I thought, wow, this, this is a prime candidate. Um, I, I, I can't even get him to talk about God. Okay. So, yeah. It's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. And, um, and then there's another one I have who thinks she's so holy uh, because she's a member of the, you know, pious attend society that she won't even re relate to us because she's, you know, doesn't want to associate herself with you know, people who who don't see it the way she does. So I got the total opposite on that end. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. All you can do is try every day um, to put your best foot forward, teach, love, um, just keep doing it. Never give up. OK, sometimes and I've learned this after so many years that it's not so much how you fight the battle all the time. No, that's important, though. But who lasts the longest? <laughs> Believe it or not. Who lasts the longest? Because, you know, when you're fighting, warring, you know, in conflict with ideas and all that. It's like, it's fun for a while, but then it begins to grate on you and um, you just, it's not worth it like it used to be. And um, so the, that's why I'm saying the one who sticks with it. And if, and if your children seeing you, like you haven't, or um, they haven't settled you back one iota, you're still the same. You, know, you may be a little more gentle about it, but you haven't changed one idea that you had told them about 20 years ago or 15 years ago when they were toddlers, but you still maintain the same faith. What's going to happen is this, and I've seen it in my own children. They're going to reach 25, 26, 27, 28, 30, you know, and all of a sudden they're like, Oh my gosh, what dad and mom said is right. You know why? Because they're raising their own children now. Okay. So, 
Yeah, it all comes back to roost, you see. So never give up. That's why I'm saying, because there someday you may not know what the day is. They could be 15, 20, 25, 30, they could be 50. And they're they're gonna realize it. Okay. Um, that what you taught them is correct, because now they have to put it into practice. All right. So I, I can safely say that of my 11 children, I have none that um, have gone off the wayside, like have become immoral, you know, drink, have sex, blah, blah, blah. None of that. Okay. And, but I get all different variations of them. One's real close to God, the other sort of mediocre, and the other, you know, you never know what you're going to get from them. Uh, but they're all moral. Okay. But you just, never know and you and you thought you put enough work into them in order for it to, to, to the for the fruit to come but the thing is sometimes you don't see the fruit till a long ways down the road okay and um so i have a lot to look forward to <laughs> uh but just don't give up don't let them affect your faith or think that somehow your faith or how you taught it or how you lived it was subpar no, and especially teenagers. These, this group of human beings are the most skeptical uh, I have ever seen in my whole life. Okay. And I've gone through it uh, many times. And I have my last teenager who's now 13. And I'm so glad about that. Um, and so I have what? One, two, three, four teenagers now that, um, you know, uh, you never know what you're going to get from them. Okay. You know, one, one morning I, I wake up and I'll see them. And, Hi dad, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And the next day they don't even know I'm in the room. Okay. So be prepared with teenagers because they're dealing with their own problems, of course. And if they're dealing with their problems, they're not going to be very nice to you. And that's a tough life to be a teenager. I don't know if you remember it going through it, but, um, um, it, it's a tough thing to go through. Now you're not a toddler anymore, <laughs> but you're not an adult. You're somewhere in between, but you don't know where you are in between and what's, you know, what's expected of you and how you exert yourself amongst all the other competition out there and yet still respect your parents and show love to people and yet protect yourself from those who want to do harm to you and, it's just, you know, life is not easy that way, especially when you don't have all the answers and your cerebral cortex hasn't been, hasn't grown fully yet for you to make these complicated decisions. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's tough out there, but don't give up. Just don't just keep doing the same thing day in and day out. And uh, you will see the fruits of it. May, and that may not be today, may not be tomorrow. But it will come. And um, so, let me see. Uh, I better get to your questions because whew, that took 50 minutes. All right. Let's see what we got here today. All right. Question. Um, does being cast into the lake of fire, the second death, in Revelation 20, result in eternal conscious torment, complete annihilation, or something else? Okay, so this is a question. Well, first of all, let's say this, that eternal damnation is eternal in the sense that those people, whatever happens to them, will never see God. Okay, so in that sense, it's eternal the punishment, being deprived of the beatific vision, okay, is eternal. If you're sent to hell, forget about it, okay? Let's just get that clear. Now, there is a question in Catholic theology, and I have investigated this pretty thoroughly. And I looked at all the councils and uh, what's been said, um, but there's a, a remaining question, which is about conscious torment, okay? And 
so the question would be, is that eternal? And the reason this comes up is because it's a matter of justice. Okay. So we, in other words, we can see that if someone doesn't love God, doesn't follow his ways, God's not going to have him in heaven. That's obvious. And they will be punished for their sins. Okay. But in normal justice, whether it's divine, human, or, well, there's nothing else, um, you are punished to the degree of your crime. Okay. In other words, um, that's why Jesus says and Paul says that the, the punishment in hell will be commensurate with the amount of sins that you have committed and the quality of the sins. Okay. So everything's going to be taken into account. All right. So if that's the case, then that means there is a criterion for how you're going to be punished. And that is because of the quantity or quality of your sins. And no more than that. You will not be punished any more than what is required of your sins. See, if that's not the case, and otherwise there would be no sense in saying there's degrees of punishment in hell. You just, you can't have half the coin without the other side. And the other side would say, okay, so whatever the punishment is I deserve, uh, in order to be just, that punishment can only last a certain time. Because if it went on for eternity, that is, you had conscious torment for eternity, well, that's more, that's way above the sins that I actually committed. Okay. And so there's, so let's just recap. On the one hand, yeah, you're in hell for eternity because you rejected God. But now we're dealing with the punishment phase of your sins. And scripture is clear in many places that you were not going to be punished more than what you deserve. Okay. Now you deserve to be separated from God because you didn't love him like he asked you to or commanded you to. And now a punishment. Okay. So that's a different phase. And that's going to deal with justice and justice demands that you're not punished beyond what your sins require. Okay, so there's been this question in the church. It's called the census pine, <clears throat> and that is the, the consciousness of punishment. And the church never says that that's eternal. Okay, it says that your presence in hell is eternal. Um, well, it says this, that you are eternally separated from God. Let's put it that way. Okay. So the question is, well, how are we going to take care of this justice matter that I'm not punished for more than what I sinned on earth? Okay. And uh, so there, it's unclear where, where the church is coming down on that. And I cover this in my uh, commentary on Matthew and Mark. Especially, especially Mark chapter 9 deals with this. You know, you've, you've heard Jesus say, you know, where the, where the, um, the fire does not, is not quenched and all that kind of stuff. Well, there are special words that are used there for quenched uh, and all fire and what that means. So you really have to study all these words to sort of get a sense where Scripture is coming down on this. And uh, the question that's left over from the church's uh, teaching on it, uh, because the church is not clear on this particular aspect of punishment. Okay? So there is a possibility that either the, the, the consciousness of punishment is taken away, but you're still eternally damned. There is a possibility that once you uh, are punished for your sins, having already been eternally separated from God, that you're whisked out of existence. That's a possibility, otherwise called annihilation. Now, the church doesn't teach annihilation, but the church doesn't teach what happens to the person who has conscious torment 
whether that conscious torment is eternal. Okay. As I said, we know the, the um, separation from God is eternal. They will never have the chance to meet God in his loving person who he is. Okay. That's punishment enough. But then you have this sense punishment, the uh, census pine, and the church just is not clear on that. So, um, and we know this, we know this, that God is just. And, and just as just as he was for sending you to hell, he's going to be just as just in determining what your punishment is. And as we said, if it already comes in degrees for different people, then that implies that um, that census punishment could end. Okay, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to leave it there because the church is the one that makes a decision on this. And um, so whenever you see the words like, you know, eternal fire, eternal punishment, eternal this, you have to be very careful how you're going to read those. Because on the one hand, we could say, yeah, the word eternal means you will never see God for all eternity. Okay, but whether that includes the census PNA. Uh, or not, is another question altogether, okay? All right. What does Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 mean? Should it be taken literally? Yes. <laughs> I can answer that before I pull the Bible down. Um, hold on one second. What do I do with my glasses? Oh, okay. Six verse four says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Okay, so all this means, you know, much is made of this, but um, who are the men of renown? To, let's start there. Who are the men of renown today? What does it say? Heroes of old. <laughs> men of renown. Who are they today? We have them today. Yeah, the Hollywood movie stars. Look, they're called stars. Wow. And, you know, if they happen to get into, into an accident or... They have a baby or they got married. They make headline news. You know, Beyonce got married today. Beyonce sang this song. Beyonce did this, you know, or Taylor Swift. Here's a, here's a big hero for today. And, and it says men of renown. Well, in the Hebrew, that means it's literally men of name. Okay. And today it's women of name. All right. Um, so Taylor Swift, what a name. You know, uh, Jason Kelsey, what a name. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, Vladimir Putin. These are all the big names, men of renown. Rockefeller, um, um, Bill Gates, you know, you go down the list. Uh, George Soros. Uh, men of name, okay, men of renown. Everybody just like, wow. You know, it makes you feel so puny because your name's not in lights like theirs is. Donald Trump, you know, it doesn't make any difference who it is. These are men of name, okay? And most of them live treacherous, sinful lives, okay? As much as the Republicans want Donald Trump to be their president because Joe Biden is so bad, Donald Trump has a lot of skeletons in his closet, okay? Uh, let's not forget that. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, you know, Israel Shamir, you know, you go down the list. You know, these are these are the same kind of men that were back in Genesis chapter 6 before the flood. What are these men teaching? Okay. Abortion, adultery, uh, you know contraception oh just go down the list they're all teaching it they're all for it 
Um, so this is what this is the condition that was popular back in this day here. Men of everybody bow to them. Oh, he, he lives like that. Let me do it too. And and uh, so and what what happened then is they got married to to women and they produced children just like them. Okay. Like, you know, George uh, or uh, Joe Biden produces a son. What's his name? Um, the one that, you know, gets jobs over in China and makes millions of dollars for doing nothing. Um, I forget his first name for some reason. Um, okay. So these are the men of the world who have... Um, establish themselves these are the nephilim if you want to use another world the great ones the giants of the day okay because that's the way some uh, translations re, re, uh, translate nephilim here it's the giants there were giants in those days <laughs> it's not talking about you know people that were nine feet tall running around that's not what the, the, the uh, you could be nine feet tall and be a great guy. Okay. These are people who had were giants in the sense that they had big names. Everybody knew them. They were household words. Okay. The football players, the basketball players, the baseball players, the baseball season just started. And then we got all the names flying everywhere. You know, uh, Shohei Otani, a big name. Okay. He's a giant. Well, now he's actually a Dodger, but he's not a giant. So, um, at, at any rate, um, you know, we even have baseball teams named the Giants, okay? And the New York Giants football team, okay? That, that's the kind of impression they want to give. These are the men of the world who own the world. Basically, they do own the world. They own every piece of property. And they and, and they enslave the people that are under them. Uh, you know that's why all the rich liberals want these um, um, illegal aliens to come in from Mexico because they want to put them to work and pay them slave wages because they're the big men of the day. You see, the Nancy Pelosi's of the day. Uh, you know, got power and they wield it here and there and. You know, everybody listens to every word they say and all that. That's what's being talked about here, okay? It has nothing to do with angels coming down and copulating with females, humans, okay? This is as ridiculous as that is. I don't know where that interpretation, well, I do know where it came from. Um, from some of the early fathers it came from, Um but um yeah it's where it started so um there is the answer to your question all right so and and what happened when all these giants you know men of name men of renown you know they started living their immoral lives and what happened god said yep i'm only going to put up with you as long as it takes Noah to build the ark. And after that, it's over, buddy. You're going to be judged. And they were. They all ended up the same way. You know, there wasn't one good one among them. Okay, and that's what happens in the world today. Who can you point to who's like really good today? Do we have any heroes like that? No. Okay, even our clerics, bishops, cardinals, popes, they're all a mess. They're all following the world. These are the giant uh, religious guys, you know, men of name. Okay, can't find anybody today. So we're, we're, we're exactly the same as it was right before the flood. And as Jesus said, you know, they're going to be marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking, dancing, having fun. And everybody's going to look around and say, hey, everything's normal. 
you know, Jesus hasn't come back. Uh, you know, that's all just a bunch of religious claptrap. Um, you know, let's just eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, and Jesus says, that's what's going to be just before I come back. Everybody's going to be saying, hey, everything's normal. And then all of a sudden, bang, just like all of a sudden, it started raining on the 120th year in Noah's day. <laughs> anyway, we need to go on. Thank you for the question, Jason. <clears throat> question, what does... Oh, we just did that one. Hi from New Zealand. Dr. Gemmel, nice to see you today. Hope things are nice in New Zealand. I'm going to go down there one of these days. Here, it's pretty nice down there. Weather's always good. Is that true? Weather's all, you have a you have a winter down there? Because I hate winter. See, the reason I hate winter is because I always get these colds in the winter. Anyway, all right. Um, Alex says, is the Bohr model for atoms not correct? Gideon Lazar, Lazar claims that subatomic particles are waves of potentia, not balls. <laughs> well, to be very honest with you, Alex, we don't know what they are, okay? We have our theories about what they are, all right? Um, we know that it can't be pure energy. It's going to have to be some particulate matter. But how that particulate matter is arranged, designed, and holds itself together, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than the Bohr model, okay? Because now they believe that Whatever the electron is, you know, it has a charge. Um, and so it can't be pure energy because it's, a, it's an entity that moves. And it's not a light beam. Okay, so what is it? Well, it's the same problem they have with trying to figure out what light is. Is light particulate or is it just waves? Because it has properties of both. Okay, once you think you've got... It down, and they thought they did for a couple of years. It's a wave, and then somebody comes up with evidence that no, it's a particle, or it acts like a particle. So, what do they call it, a wavicle now? <laughs> so they have no idea. All right. And so, what does that tell you? That tells you this world's very complex. What you think you know today will be um, upset tomorrow. That's the way science works today. So. I don't think Gideon should say that these are waves because he doesn't really know. Okay. Uh, we know that there's somewhere between a particle and a wave, but we just don't know how to describe it. Same with light. We don't know how to describe it. We do know that the Bohr model is somewhat simple. And yet, even though it's simple, you know, you still have valence numbers for atoms which will determine how they can combine with another element you know you got carbon dioxide co2 so we know that the carbon outer orbit is going to take two um, oxygen electrons and make carbon dioxide okay so it has a valence number of what what would that be um um, plus two or minus two, I forget how, how that works. But, um, you know, so we know that the Bohr model does describe that, you know, the, how the carbon atom can take in an oxygen atom or how water, which is H2O, um, where the valence number of the outer orbit of oxygen is what? plus six, so it can take in two more electrons. And the car and hydrogen in them has one electron. And so if you to get it most stable, you put two electrons in the outer orbit of the oxygen atom, and you got water, H2O. Okay? So the Bohr model works in that way, and that's why it's still used today. Okay? Even in organic chemistry, which is much more complicated than inorganic chemistry. But yet, when you get to 
when you're um, and this came about with a Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is still with us today, wherein you can't measure the uh, momentum and the position of the electron at the same time. So you never know where the electron's going to be in the atom. Which then, if you think this out, which then uh, makes people think that the electron is not something that goes around in an orbit like the planet goes around the sun. Because if we can't break through the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to know its momentum and position, then we really don't know where it is from time to time. Okay. And uh, so that's what makes these scientists think that it's an electron cloud. That's the best they can describe it. Electron cloud. And what's a cloud? It's like fog. You never know what's what. You know, there's no direction to it. There's no place where you say, hey, here's a solid place. And, uh, you know, not in a fog, not in the cloud. Okay. It's all ethereal. And that's, that's their view of it today. So that's where, you know, Gideon is getting this idea. Um, so that's where we are in science. We haven't advanced beyond that yet. And that's because, as I said, of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. All right, question. Do you need to speak out loud for a saint to hear you ask for prayers? <laughs> well, we don't know for sure because... You know, there's either two ways this happens. One is that uh, God gives the ability to the saint to hear, a, you know, auricular or vocal prayers, okay? Because saints can't read your mind, all right? Uh, only God can read your mind. Uh, so let's say you prayed, in that case, you prayed to God in the name of a saint, and God reads your thoughts and tells that saint, you have someone who is praying to you. And I know, but you don't know. But here it is. Here's the prayer. Okay. And that saint will follow up on whatever he has to do. Okay. So that's one way. So that no prayer you ever say is wasted, let's say. Like, so nobody's hearing me. No, God hears every prayer. Okay, and he'll give it to the appropriate saint as you've asked for it. Okay, so that's what would happen in cases like, you know, if you're praying in your mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I've lasted for an hour and 15 minutes, so let's see how long I can last after this. All right. Um what does God of hosts mean? Um, God of hosts means um, a host is a um, like an army around you. Okay. Uh, the angels around God would be his host. Okay. That's just sort of a weird word because we have, you know, the Eucharist is a host. <laughs> okay. So, um, but normally in, you know, the Old Testament, it says, I am the Lord God of hosts. Um, that means he has his angelic beings surrounding him, his army of angelic beings, Lord God of hosts. And um, now it doesn't necessarily have to be angels, but it, it just refers to um Either the enemies God has destroyed, uh, or the um, the the um, soldiers that are fighting with Him in this you know evil world. I am the Lord God of hosts, so it means I have a lot of power. In other words, okay. Imprimatur update. Um, yeah, you can forget that. The Bible has already been completed, if that's what you're referring to. The commentary, New Testament commentary on Douay Reims. Okay. Um, that was completed earlier this, this year. And you can buy all four volumes now. 
Okay, go to robertsongenis.org. We have a special 20% off, okay, for um, those who buy all four volumes of the uh, commentary series of the New Testament. And by the way, I have to tell you that um, we have the DVD ready for you. How the World Was Made in Six Days. And it's not Carl Keating's interpretation. Just want to let you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're the fundamentalists that he doesn't like. And this is day two. Okay. Day two. It's about an hour and a half long. And for sale for you up on our website, um, journey to the center of the universe.org. Or you can shorten that by acronym jttcotu.com or dot work um, in other words jtt that's journey to the center of the universe just taking the first letters that's our science website in case you wanted to know then the other one uh, right here robertsongenis.org is all our theological biblical catechetical you know patristic whatever issues that we deal with so all right um and see how much is the, uh, the the new commentary of Luke and Acts? If you just want to buy that singly, is sixty nine dollars. Sorry, but prices are going up. Nothing I can do about it. Um, except pass it along to you. Weren't you lucky? Um, and then the uh, DVD day two is what fifteen? I think it's fifteen dollars. Plus tax and shipping and all that, you know. Anyway, so um, let me go on here. Could you comment on Protestant creationist contention that no creature ate meat before the fall? Well, I believe they are correct. Okay? believe, And we will cover this in our creation series. In day five, we will cover this. Okay? But... Um, you see, the, there's this very important principle that God himself tells us about at the beginning of, was it Genesis 2, verse 7 or 17? He says, Adam, in the day you eat of it, that's the fruit of the forbidden tree, you will die. Okay? And we know that in Scripture, animals are intimately connected intimately connected to humans, especially when life and death issues are there. Like, look at the flood. The animals didn't do anything. <laughs> but they got punished, along with the humans. Okay? And you'll find this throughout Scripture. Whenever the humans get punished, the animals get punished. There's no separation. Okay? Okay? Which implies then what? That otherwise the animals would experience no death. As long as the humans obey, the animals survive. No death. Okay. Now someone may say, well, what about the plants? This is Jimmy Aiken, by the way. What about the plants? They die. Uh, no, they don't. Because according to scripture, they're not, they don't have life. Okay. Only things with what the Bible calls the breath of life, where it says, you know, God created Adam and God breathed into him life. Okay. That's what gives you life. There's no breathing into a plant. Okay. Animals, same thing. God breathes into them life, and they take on a soul. Um, and in that sense, they are life, whereas plants are not life. That's why Adam could eat the other uh, plants of the... As a matter of fact, the whole reason he's in the Garden of Eden is because God made a garden for him, a garden of exquisite plants that he could eat the fruit of, and trees, of course special trees that were put in the Garden of Eden that he could eat, okay? So 
the Bible doesn't consider that a death if Adam rips off an apple from a tree. Only those with the breath of life, and that only applies to humans and animals. Okay, so in that sense, um, and we earlier we talked about adaption, right? Humans have to adapt to the new world that they're confronted with after the flood. Okay, so the temperature is lower, the pressure is lower. Um, it's just not the same as it was in the, in the pre-flood age. And we've had to adapt. Well, same thing with, you know, um, adapting to the fact that um, we can now eat animals. Because um, prior to that, we didn't have to eat animals. We, we ate the fruit, and that was enough. Did we get hungry? Did Adam get hungry? He sure did. Okay. Now, somebody will say, well, but if Adam was promised that he wouldn't die, why does he need to eat in the first place? Okay. Well, because Adam has to be a responsible human being. He needs to eat to survive. That food is going to be used by his body, even as it is today, okay, to keep him healthy. And he's responsible to do that. That's why he's responsible to till the garden. Why did God give him that job to do? Because he's going to have to create his own food. Okay? And it wasn't like the rest of the earth. This was a special garden. You know, he had very exquisite plants that um, would not be like the typical tree out in the rest of the world. Okay? And... Um, now, God would see to it that Adam um, continued to nourish his body, okay? Just like Jesus, um, you know, when he's confronted by the devil. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, um, you know, the devil says, hey, hey, just uh, throw yourself off the this mountain here. And it says, you know, the angels will hold you up so that you don't dash your foot against a stone. Okay? And Jesus, what, is, what does he say back to him? He says, I shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay? So there is a sense here where um, Jesus, because he's Jesus, and he's going to be protected by God until the cross, um, will not allow him to dash his foot against a stone. That's true. Psalm 91 is true. And how's that going to happen? Well, God's going to have the angels surround him and make sure he doesn't get hurt in any way. Okay? Same thing with Adam. All right? He's, God's going to make sure that he doesn't slip and fall off the cliff, so to speak. And if he does, he's got angels there um, holding him up, putting him back on the ground. Okay? That's what it means that... He will never die. And there's nothing internal that's going to have that happen, but he's got to nourish himself. Okay, he's responsible for that. And uh, so he can, you know, maintain his life. And God's going to see to it that there's no cracks. Okay, that's the privilege of having God in your life. Where all the cracks are taken care of. There's nothing that's going to harm you. And what is it when we sin? Well, God takes that protection away, okay? Takes it away. That's why we get sick today. That's why I get sick. That's why people get cancer and heart disease, because God's not going to be there to protect them. Sorry, you relinquish that, that little um, joy of life when your father sinned, terrible sin. So you're not going to have my protection. What was it with Israel? When Israel went from, you know, took, they came out of Egypt, they went through uh, the desert. What did God do? Well, he's, these were special people, and he protected them. Okay? As long as they were obedient, he protected them. He, they gave, he gave them water when they needed water. 
Um, he gave them light at night by the pillar of fire. Uh, and he led them in the daytime by the, the cloud. Here's the way to go. Okay. And he made them shoes that didn't wear out. Can you imagine that? Yeah, well, that's God taking care of you, you see. And he did the same for Adam. And he would do the same for us, except, you know, we relinquish that. It's only special times that God is going to, you know, do everything that's necessary to take care of you. So that you don't dash your foot against the stone. Okay. Um, and that's all because of sin. Okay. So anyway, I think I answered your question. So let me go back to the list here. Dr. Ortland likes to point out Jews in Jesus' time didn't have a magisterium. So why should we need one now? Didn't Jesus rebuke the Pharisees for tradition? <laughs> well, you see, the Pharisees were in a sort of an aberration. They, you know, it's it's like Haiti today, you know. The uh, the police and the government aren't there now, so who's going to take over? The gangs. The Pharisees, they're like the gangs. Go in there and fill the vacuum. That's all that's about. Sadducees, the same thing, okay? These were just the popular, you know, these were the men of name, men of renown, the giants of those days. That's what the Pharisees were and the Sadducees, okay? So prior to that, you know, if you're talking about the Jews setting up, um, you know, when they came out of Egypt, what did, what's one of the first things that Moses did? He set up 72 elders to help him judge the people, okay? So here you have the beginnings of the magisterium, okay? And I'm sure they got divine help, just like the Pope does, so that he doesn't err in, um, you know, dogmatic proclamations. They had help back then because they had uh, the Urim, Urim and the Thummim. Okay? And that was a device wherein you could ask God a question. Now, the priest had to wear uh, an ephod, they called it. Uh, and they sometimes call it the Urim and the Thummim. And it's not what the Mormons believe on this, okay? So still get them out of the way. Um, um, he, he would put this garment on, and then you could ask God a question. That had to be yes or no answer. And so you had, you had to phrase it right, okay? Because it wasn't guaranteed that God was going to do that or, you know, uh, answer six of your questions. You were lucky if you got one. And so you'd ask us in such a way where you know God's only going to give a yes or no answer. So you better phrase it correctly so that you get the right context and answer that you need for this particular situation. Okay? Like, for example, one, one issue was in Numbers chapter 5, there was a man who was caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. Okay, now, you know, the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to work. And so he's picking up sticks. What are you picking up sticks for? Okay, that may have been an innocent thing. You know, I need to start a fire or I need, you know, I don't know. Um, and, and they didn't know what to do with him because it seemed like a very trivial, you know, action to go pick up sticks. And remember, it got so bad where the Pharisees would accuse the apostles of working on the Sabbath when the apostles went into the wheat field and started taking the wheat from the top of the wheat plant. And the Pharisees said, you're working. You're working. So that's how bad it got. But at any rate, they weren't allowed to work. And so the man's picking up sticks, and it seems so trivial. So they bring it to the elders. And the elders can't figure it out. So they bring it to God. 
All right. So here's your magisterium bringing it to God, and God says, he shall be stoned. Wow. Because, you know, a lot of those elders might have just said, all right, well, let's let him go. Come on. It's really trivial. Um, but right before that chapter, or, or in the beginning of that chapter, it talks about deliberate sin versus inadvertent sin or non-deliberate sin. And it says, if a man commits a sin, deliberately does the sin, he shall lose his life. Okay? And then it says, the man who does not do it deliberately, does it inadvertently. He sinned, but he didn't know it, or there's some circumstantial issue involved. You know, he shall not lose his life. Okay, right before this issue of the man who's picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. So God says that he shall be killed, and they stone him. And so, what does that mean? Well, it means he did it deliberately. God was the one who knew his heart, and he knew the man was picking up sticks, like saying, "Ha ha, I'm working," but it's trivial. What are you going to do about it? Kind of an attitude. And so God said, okay, buddy. Your time is up. We're not going to tolerate that. And he was killed. Okay. So here they could talk to God, basically. God would answer them. Uh, in, the, in the days of Samuel and the kings, they had the priest. They didn't call it the Urmum, Urmum and the Thummim then. They called it the Ephod. Priest would wear the ephod. He could go to God, ask him a question. Now, this is special circumstances, okay? This didn't happen every day. And God would say yes or no. So they had a magisterium. They had something to keep them from error. Because you can bet your bottom dollar something very serious came up. Um, you know, that, that uh, they would contact God and he would let them know. Okay. So that's basically the precedent for the Catholic magisterium. The Catholic magisterium is, as Jesus said, guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth. Okay. Well, how's that going to happen unless God intrudes and keeps the Pope from error? Okay. Something divine has to happen. Because God put himself on the line. Now, Jesus did in Matthew 16. He said, Whatever, whatsoever you bind shall be bound in heaven. Whoa. Okay. Well, we know that heaven cannot tell a lie. Heaven always has to tell the truth. So if you're going to say that what Peter binds is bound in heaven, and that means that whatever heaven binds can't be a lie. It has to be the truth. That means that what Peter says has to be the truth, at least when Peter deems it so. Okay? So, that's the protection. And that, the precedent for that came in the Old Testament magisterium. Okay? All right. Oh. All right, question. Will the last times of the false prophet and of the Antichrist last three and a half or seven years? No. All right. That's a number that the premillennials use. Uh, first of all, they use seven years for the, you know, tribulation period. Okay. And then you got pre-tribulationist, mid-tribulationist, and post-tribulationist. And that refers to when they think the rapture is going to occur. Okay, because see, they believe that when Jesus comes back the second time, he's going to establish a 1,000 year millennial reign or millennium. This 1,000 year, same thing as millennium. A 1,000 year kingdom on earth starting at Jerusalem. Okay, it's called millennialism. 
it's wrong. Okay, there's not an ounce of truth to it. But prior to that second coming, they believe Jesus is going to come back in a secret coming called the rapture. And the rapture is going to take the church out of the world, bring it to heaven. But they're not sure whether that's going to come before the seven years, mid seven years, which would be three and a half years, or at the end of the seven years. But either way, you have a seven year period. Okay. Now the rapture occurs to take the church out of the way so the Jews can control the world. And there the Jews are going to go through this seven year tribulation and wait for Jesus to come back at the second coming. And he's going to go to Jerusalem and establish the Jews as his leaders of his kingdom. Okay. That's the um, Protestant premillennial or historic premillennial view. Uh, otherwise known as dispensationalism. Okay, and that gets a little complicated, so we won't go there right now. But no. So to answer your question, no. We don't know how long the Antichrist will reign. Okay. It's all it says in in Apocalypse chapter 20, verse 3, is he will he, he will create this havoc for a little season quote unquote that's it that's all we've got little season now we can speculate on how long that might be okay and i do in my apocalypse commentary i'm not going to go into that right now but it's not three and a half years it's not seven years okay sometimes they get these numbers from apocalypse 11 you know where it says their body shall lie in the street for three and a half days um, that has nothing to do with anything, basically. All it is is um, a number that's symbolic of the short time period that God's going to allow these things to happen. It's like three and a half days is a very short time period as opposed to the 42 months or 1260 days that are also used in Apocalypse 11. And he adds a half just to let you know that this is exact. It's like going by your watch. Huh? It's 1230 now. Lunch is over. Okay. So we could say 12. It's 12 o'clock. But if you say 1230, that means you got an exact time. Okay. That's what he's trying to convey in the three and a half days. It's all it's all symbolic. Okay. So that's the other place that they, they try to go to. Um, and most Catholics don't have a clue about how to put this together unfortunately, because they've been following these Protestant premillennialists who write all the books on eschatology. There's hardly any Catholics that write on eschatology, um, which is probably good, actually. Um, but that's where they're getting these ideas from, okay? All right. Um, question, does fiducia supplicans fall under the umbrella of Pope's infallibility with regards to teaching on faith and morals? If so, what does it mean if one disagrees with it? Uh, we can definitely say that it's not an infallible teaching. What is it? Ca uh, Canon 730, I think it is. I'm not sure what the number is there. It says, nothing is in to be deemed as infallible teaching unless it is expressly manifest that it is infallible. Okay? Remember that. So we always know that modo proprios, encyclicals, letters from the Pope are not infallible. Never was, never will be. Okay? The only time the Pope does an infallible teaching is when he says, this is an infallible teaching, and even then you got to be careful. Okay, so um, yeah, be very careful there. Um, so you don't have to uh, you don't have to agree with it. Okay, you can give your respect to it because it's coming from the Pope. Okay, you got my respect. I just don't think you're going in the right direction. Okay, um, that's as bad as much as we can do, other than 
following Canon 212, which says we have the right and duty to tell our pastors when they have gone off the track. And this is one of them. As the bishops of Africa have done in unison to tell the Pope, sorry, we love you, Pope, but you're going off the deep end on this one, okay? And we're going to give public dissent, okay? And we're, we're trying to get you to, you know, relook at this thing, okay? So it's, it's a delicate thing, okay? Because you got to respect the Pope on the one hand, all right? And yet you got to stick up for truth on the other. And if you know your Pope's going off the deep end here, you got to say something, okay? Now, the one thing that we are happy about is fiducia supplicans didn't, um, you know, condone gay marriage. That's what everybody was afraid was going to happen. It was somehow the Pope's going to go off the deep end and fall into the pit and condone this. And he didn't. He didn't even come close to it. <coughs> because he says ex exactly the opposite in uh, fiducia supplicans. But then on the other hand, you know, he did one thing right and then did another thing not so good. Give sort of the impression that, you know, homosexual couples can receive a blessing from the church. You know, and, every, you know, give all kinds of arguments about blessings and all, you know, they're just spontaneous things. Yeah, we all understand that. But come on, man, you live in the real world. In the real world, you give people an impression. You imply something. So if you're going to go the legal route and go, well, there's something really illegal about it, and you leave it at there, well, come on, man, you're not dealing with the real world. The, re the real world goes far beyond the legal or the illegal. Okay? And, and they know what you're trying to do. They know your agenda. And, you know, Pope Francis has a notorious... Um, history regarding um, gays. In Argentina, he tried to make civil unions, for Pete's sake. Okay? So we know where his mind's at. Um, so he doesn't get any grace from us just for being legal. Okay? <coughs> We're not stupid. All right. Let's, let's go on. All right. Got a few more minutes here. What is the causal mechanism of a fixed earth as it first appeared? Not the maintenance of it. Okay, so as it first appeared, well, if there's nothing to move it, then it's going to stay fixed, okay? You're going to have to have a force. If you want, if the earth is going to move, oh, excuse me. Oh. If the earth is going to move, there has to be a force to move it, okay? So if you just put it in open space, and by the way, the space would have to be created in order to put the earth in it. Okay? And that's part of the heavens. It says, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the heavens is a very complicated word. But in the first instance, it means God created the space. Because space is not nothing. Space is a something. Physical something. It's discrete. We can't sense it with our senses. We can't see it, hear it, you know, feel it. But it's there, okay? And um, that has to be made, and then the earth is made inside of that space, okay? But in order for the earth to move, you would have to have the space with a force or a force in the space to move the earth. And since that wasn't there then the earth is fixed, okay? So that's the causal mechanism for the initiation period, all right? 
And then, of course, we can get into all the other reasons why it's maintained, but that would be the reason. If there's no force, it's not going to move. Okay? All right. When is my raise kicking in? Oh, did I tell you? 2027. <laughs> Give you a raise. Uh, question, I just said, is if Abraham refused to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, would he have committed a serious sin? Uh, no, but he wouldn't have been chosen as the man of faith that God would use to um, start the, the um, Jewish faith. Okay. Um, I mean, you can only sin if you go against the moral law of God, basically. If God asks you to do something over and above, um, you do have the right to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And then God is going to make his decision as to whether, you know, you did that deliberately or, you know, whatever. He's, he's going to be able to judge, but I'd have to say no. Okay. God would just go get another man. Somebody who's going to um, fill the requirements of the kind of man that God wants to start this religion. Okay. And um, that's the way I would see it. All right. Um, what does it mean for God to create Eve by removing one of Adam's ribs? Does the word rib have some other connotations in Hebrew? Not that I know of. The rib's a rib. Um, um, but that's a good question. It's a good question. I, I, I think I want to do some work on that. Thanks for ribbing me on that. I'll do some etymology on that and see if I can come up with something for you next time. All right. Who sponsors this show? Nobody. You still have contacts at EWTN. Um, no. I mean, I do know people that work there. Obviously, I know you like Raymond Arroyo. I know Marcus Grodi. I think they're the only two left that I know at EWTN. Uh, oh, what's his name? He used to do the book thing. I think he's like the vice president or something. I forget his name. Yeah, that was uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> My days at EWTN. I did two shows for them. One on Not by Faith Alone, the book I wrote, and the other on Not by Scripture Alone. One was an 18-part series, and the other was a 16-part series. Um, it's no longer available at EWTN. Um, let me see. What else? I did Mother Angelica's show twice, I think. I did The Abundant Life a couple of times. I forget what else I did there. Long time ago. Um, who sponsors this show? Um, well, Holy Faith Media is the uh, people who produce it. Okay, but um, that's as far as it goes. <coughs> All right. Um, what does Daniel's a time times and half a time mean? Um, it means the same thing as the 1260 days or 42 months of Apocalypse 11 and 12. And what does that mean? What's the 1260 days or 42 months? It's again a symbolic number, okay? That refers to the whole New Testament period. That is from the first coming of Christ to the second coming. In, um, was it Apocalypse 17? It's called a time, time, and a half a time. Time, times, and a half a time. 
So you got time is one year, times is two years, and a half time, which is a half a year. So you have three and a half years. Same number, okay? So the 1260 days, the 42 months, time, times, and half a time are all the same period of time. That is from the first coming of Christ to the second coming. Okay? Um, why do they use that? Well, the number 42 has high significance in the Bible. Um, there are 42 names mentioned uh, in Matthew's genealogy. And he has to take out some names in order to get the 42. Okay? Um, when Egypt, When the Israelites left Egypt... And before they came to Canaan, there were 42 encampments, exactly 42 encampments. Okay, so number 42 is pretty significant. Um, and that is a time period that was taken from the Old Testament and applied now to the New Testament with the time ending being the second coming of Christ and the time beginning mean the first coming of Christ. Okay. 1260 days is the same thing, but you might ask, well, why is it 1260 days and not 42 months? Okay. Because 42 months is given to the Gentiles. It says in apocalypse 11 verse one and two, and they will rule the world for that 42 month period. The church is under the number 1260 days and that begins in the next chapter apocalypse 12 where it says that the woman was um, chased by the dragon into the earth for 1260 days okay so when you see days as opposed to months or even years. What does that tell you? Well, in that chapter, it says that the, the woman was helped by the earth because the, the dragon cast out a flood and the earth opened up and drank the flood and the woman was safe from the dragon. Now, again, all symbolic, okay? It's all symbolic of the church being taken care of by God as she's in this desert and the dragon throws out blasphemies and false doctrines and abortion and blah 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 and tries to eat up the woman tries to flood her so she can't survive you see and the earth helped the woman that's the governments that help the, the church to um, you know legally have a defense against the devil and that happens for 1260 days what does that represent well Whenever you have days, um, that means every single day is looked at. It's not like a massive time, you know, like 42 months or three and a half years. It's daily. And like we pray the prayer, our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Okay? Daily. Don't leave us for a second. Okay? Come to us every single day. And that's what the 1260 days is. God is there every single day for the same time period from the first coming to the second coming. Just like the Gentiles rule from the first coming to the second coming, you see. So um, that's what it's talking about. Okay. Remember, we, we looked at the three and a half days. Why is it three and a half? Why isn't it just three? Because that extra half is symbolic of the exact time. God's not going to let them suffer for one second longer than the plan allows. Not one second, you see. So a lot of these numbers, you have to be, you know, you have to know how they're used in the rest of Scripture. But um, that, to answer your question, they're all the same number, okay? Oh, <laughs> Francis says you were bad for not taking the vaccine. Yeah, I know. Oh, well.
Uh, I'm really tired. I just can't. I just can't do anymore. So um, you'll have to forgive me because I'm just not feeling well. Anyway, pray for me. Hopefully, I can get better by next Wednesday, and I'll be back on the 27th of March. So um, stop by robertsongenis.org. We have a lot of new books and DVDs for you. If you can think about, um, you know, becoming a monthly donor, that would be great. You can go to the website there and it'll help you do that. Otherwise, have a great week and we'll see you when you come back. And uh, God be with you all. Keep walking on the 1260 days. Keep holding your head up high. Don't let the world get to you. You do what the Lord told you to do and keep doing it every day. And soon it will be over. Thank God for that. Take care.